Hi everyone, uh, we're going to hit upon a review topic today, which is computer output. And it's kind of one of those things that could be easily missed and not covered, but it shows up in the AP exam to the point where it's probably a good idea to make sure that we can deal with whatever they're gonna throw at us and this being one of the things. So we're just gonna start out, I grabbed a few problems that I found in older exams and found every place where there was a computer output that I could find so that we could you know, apply it and figure it out and see how it works. So in this first one up here, um, we've got Frank who lives in Texas and his sister Lily who lives in Japan. They send mail back and forth. Um, from what he can tell from the postmarks on these letters, it appears that it takes longer for Lily's mail from Japan to reach him in Texas than it does the other way around from Texas to Japan. So Frank checks with the post office and the postmaster tells him that delivery times of the letters in both directions should be the same, which sounds like an HO, right? So HO, if you define mu1 as the average time it takes for letters to go from Japan to Texas and mu2 being the average time that it takes for a letter to go from Texas to, J to Japan according to the postmaster uh, HO would be that mu1 equals mu2 alright um, alright let's see um, Frank and his sister decide to collect data to see if the letters from Japan to Texas take longer, all right? So if we're doing taking longer, that sounds like an HA, right? So that mu1, that's Japan to Texas, is greater than mu2, which would be the average time going the other way. So they record the delivery times in days, they decide the assumptions are okay, they perform a two sample t-test and obtain this output, okay. All right, so it's two sample T, uh, two Texas versus two Japan, all right? Um, here is N, your sample sizes, 12, two Texas from Japan, nine going the other way. And so here are the two means, and here are the two standard deviations. You don't need the standard error of the mean, all right? They always throw in extra stuff. That is stuff we really don't need to answer the question. Now, curiously enough, they give you a 95% confidence interval, right? And if you look at this, this is going to trap zero, right? Zero is included in that confidence interval. So if you were gonna do this according to a confidence interval in place of a regular test of significance, you might say, oh, there's evidence that there's no difference, but keep in mind, you really can't use this confidence interval. Uh, so I'm gonna cross it off. And the reason you can't use it is because it's two-sided, right? Remember, HO is that mu1 equals mu2, and HA was that mu1 was greater than mu2, all right? That's one directional. A confidence interval is two directions, all right? So we can't use that. But we can use this bottom one, all right? Now you can tell that it's one direction because they list the greater than. So here's the T value for your test of significance, here's your P value, and here's your degrees of freedom. So it says using a significance level of, and that'll be your alpha, 0.05, which of the following statements best describes the conclusion that can be drawn from these data, all right? So if alpha is 0.05 and your P value is 0.058, well, P is greater than alpha, so you're gonna to fail to reject. All right, so let's see if we can pick out what the right answer is. All right, there is convincing evidence that there's no difference in the delivery times. Um, no, um, we're, this is not stating it. We, we might pick this, but let's just, um, uh, go further. So there is convincing evidence that there is a difference in the delivery times. All right, if we're gonna fail to reject HO, we're saying that that's true, right? So that's out. 
There is convincing evidence that the mean delivery time from Japan to Texas is greater than the mean delivery time. All right, that would be rejecting HO, and we're not doing that. So there's not convincing evidence that the mean delivery time from Texas, uh, Japan to Texas is greater than the mean delivery time from Texas to Japan. That sounds a lot more detailed and a lot better answer than A. So I'm going to strike out A. And t-tests cannot be used for sample size that are this small. All right, we can go ahead and safely turn that out because um, it says that they figured that the assumptions were reasonable. All right, so I guess they did a little of the prelimin uh, preliminary work. And so if they say it's reasonable, it's not for us to judge that it isn't. Okay? All right, so there's the first one. And that's two sample t-tests. And they could do a one sample, but and it should be somewhat similar. All right, um, so the next one is just summary uh, data for um, analyzing univariate data. It goes all the way back to chapter one. So um, data on homes recently sold in a certain town included the area of the home reported in square feet. The table below shows summary statistics of the reported areas in square feet. All right, so let's look this over. Um, we've got the mean, the median. Uh, so here's your mean, here's your median. You got the smallest value, then Q1, Q3, maximum, and standard deviation. So we change the color here. Remember, your mean and your standard deviation, those go together. The other ones, your minimum, your Q1, your median, your Q3, and your max are part of your five number summary, so those go together. So don't mix up the green with the red, all right? So let's see what we've got here. Um, an auditor determined that an error was made in the reported areas and that all of the areas should have been 100 square feet greater than what was reported. So we're going to add 100 to each data value, which we don't really have access to, but we can pr pretty much know what's going to happen, all right? So if you add 100 to each data value, let's see, that'll force your mean to go up by 100. Your minimum, that'll go up by 100, all right? Q1 should go up by 100. Your median should go up by 100 or so, Q3, should go up by 100. Your maximum should go up by 100. Your standard deviation should stay the same, right? Because whatever this distribution happens to be, it's just moving up, like it's advancing to the right on an x-axis by 100 units, everything is. So it's not changing the spread, it's just changing the location, all right? So um, let's see, now your IQR shouldn't change either because if you're adding a hundred remember uh, IQR is Q3 minus Q1 and so if you add a hundred to um, both of these and you subtract them then that's going to end up negating the 100 so if you subtract these from the original data set that should hold that would be 102 all right so that should go that should go that should go all right, so it's gonna be um, either A or B. And remember that your standard deviation, the spread as you move the whole distribution 100 units to the right will not change. So your answer should be A, okay? All right, um, if you have questions on anything that I'm going over, you can certainly ask it. And I forgot to mention too, that you could actually do this worksheet ahead of time and just see how you do based upon the knowledge that you have, all right? So let me go ahead and pause for a second. All right, guys, I'm back and we've got another problem here. We'll just go up to this one. And the computer output below shows the result of a linear regression analysis for predicting the concentration of zinc in parts per million from the concentration of lead, all right? So um, the concentration of lead should be your explanatory and the zinc should be 
your response. And actually, um, regression computer output does show up more than just about any other kind of output. So uh, let's go ahead and see what we've got. It says, which of the following statements is a correct interpretation of the value 19.0 in the output? Ooh, okay, that's here. So let's go ahead and look at what all these numbers are. All right, constant is going to be the A, remember? y hat equals a plus bx, right? So that's an estimate of the y-intercept. And this is gonna be the b or the slope. Um, remember, this is a t value and a p value. This is the standard error of your b. We use these three things for uh, linear regression uh, t procedures. Um, s was a feature of that. We don't need to go into that. Remember, R squared is your coefficient of determination. And if you want R, you just take the square root, keeping in mind whatever sign you have for your slope has to be the same for R. Okay, so we know that this is going to be slope. All right, so we can just go ahead and say that B equals 19 over one. And this is, uh, let's see, a one part per million increase in concentration of lead, that's PB, same root thing as plumbing, and then the, the uh, numerator would be your change in your Y, remember change in Y over change in X, and that would be your part per million increase in zinc. All right, so that's the interpretation of it. So let's see what's right. On average, there's a predicted increase in 19.0 uh, parts per million of lead, no. Okay, it's each increase of one part per million in lead predicts a 19 part per million increase in zinc on average, all right? So B is on average, there's a predicted increase of 19.0 parts per million in concentration of zinc for every increase of one part per million in concentration of lead found in fish. That sounds right, all right? Um, let's see, the predicted concentration of zinc is 19.0 parts per million in fish with no, no, that sounds like a y-intercept. Predicted concentration of lead is 19.0 parts per million in fish with no concentration of zinc. Uh, I don't know what that is. And then approximately 19% of the variability in zinc concentration is predicted by the linear relationship with lead concentration. No, not really. Um, that's actually referring to R squared. And so if they're asking about it, that value to, for it to be a true statement would be 82% because that relates to this guy up here. Okay, so um, pretty easy. We've kind of done a lot of that. Now I'm gonna end with this one, and there is output for chi-square, and there'll be, I think, output for chi-square in your homework. Um, we learned it, it's not on the AP exam, so I'm not gonna review it, but I think you know it well enough to answer any questions on it. So, let's see what we have here. Um, each person in a random sample of adults was asked how many DVDs he or she owned. Summary statistics are given below. All right, so this is just univariate data analyzed for how many DVDs, all right? So which of the following is true? All right, 75%, well, let's just kind of build some things here. Um, we have the sample size, we have the mean, so the mean and the standard deviation go together, and then we should have like the five number summary. Um, let's see, we have the minimum right here, we have, uh, that was supposed to be in green, or red rather. So we have the minimum here. We have the maximum here, Q1, Q3, median. And we don't need this trim mean. That's just a way to handle outliers. And we don't need the standard error of the mean. So um, let's just kind of look and see before we start answering what we've got. We'll just put a five number summary up here, whoops need an N, not an M. All right, so the minimum is zero. 
uh, Q1 is 30, median is 50, uh, Q3 is 95, and the maximum, wow, is 3,000. So let's just kind of examine the spacing here. This is plus 30, this is plus 20, this is plus 45, and this bad boy is plus 2,905. Wow, so can we say that this is gonna be pretty skewed right? Big time. All right, and remember that if we look at this, and I'm just gonna kind of create a very crude box plot here, it's not really gonna be indicative of what's perfect, right? But remember that each of these is, this will represent 25% of your data, this is 25%, this is 25%, and so on. So we've broken into quartiles, right? So 75, percent of adults in the sample own more than 95. That would be this right here. And that's only 25%, so that's out, all right? So 50% of the adults in the sample own between zero and 129.4, all right? That's, the, that's X bar, all right? And you can't mix X bar into this kind of presentation, so that's out. The distribution of the number of DVDs owns appears to be approximately symmetric. Uh -uh. Right? Skewed to the right, so that's out. Um, the interquartile range um, is going to be 65. All right, so let's see. Remember, IQR equals Q3 minus Q1. And so that'll be 95 minus 30, which is 65. And so that looks good. Um, the distribution of the number of DVDs owns contains outliers on both sides of the low side and the high side. Yeah, okay. What I did to check that, although I knew that this was already right and I could have just moved on, you know, but just so that you can see that I did check it. Um, remember, this is Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR, which is 65. And anything that, um, and remember, let's see, Q3 is 95. So if you add 95 to that product, you get 192.5. So you do have an upper outlier. You have at least one. Right, because this is way above this. But check the bottom. So that would be Q1 minus 1.5 times 65. And Q1 is 30, so this number is gonna go negative, right? It ends up being negative 67.5, so there are no lower outliers, right? So that contradicts this. It says both on the high and the low side, all right? So there are some things for you to take up as far as not just reading the computer output, but answering these questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this out and discuss your homework real quickly, all right? So this is what you're going to be looking at for com uh, interpreting computer output, and there's a bunch of it. So they give you software packages like Datadesk, Minitab, Fathom, SAS. These will be kind of similar. Maybe Fathom will be a bit different, but Datadex, Desk, Minitab, and SAS should be kind of the same. They show you TI-83, um, yeah, they, they don't show you calculator output, but it's here, so we can look at it. So regression analysis, here's some uh, data, and here's some scenario. All right, Datadesk, uh, they give you the scatter plot. Uh, let's see, they give you R, R squared, um, I don't know that we need degrees of freedom, although if we were doing a LINREG t-test we would, and that's not on the AP exam. All right, um, let's see. This sum of square stuff and F ratios is not important. Um, your variable is constant, that would be A. Weak would be B. And you have your T value 6.67 and then your probability. Typically your probability will be two-sided unless they indicate it. 
and um, there's a residual plot and I'm not sure oh this is mini tab all right so that's everything you need for data desk mini tab all right there is your uh, scatter plot there's your regression equation I'm not sure that data desk did give you the um, LSRL but you can certainly build it but here they do give it to you in mini tab um, here's uh, A and B here's R and R uh, R squared adjusted ignore that um, and you know T and P like if you're doing Linreg T test anything that says analysis of variance ignore it alright there's your residual plot and that's still mini tab alright Fathom is was really popular a few years ago I don't know you never really see it in AP uh, testing but anyway it's here so here's residual here's scatter plot and they give you the independent and dependent n uh, here's the LSRL correlation R squared they even <laughs> tell you what the interpretation of R squared is all right we don't really need this but this would be a 95 percent confidence interval for linear regression T procedures which we never did do uh, here's an interpretation for the y-intercept all right here is SAS scatter plot Ig ignore analysis of variance all right uh, here is the intercept anything that is not intercept is the slope T and P residual plot and here is TI-83 output um, you can pick up pretty much what it's got um, yeah here's your linear regression that's the major thing here's your um, residual graph scatter plot and R squared and R and uh, this is what I need for you to answer for homework all right um, you just look back at each of these uh, displays of output and just put a check if you can get the um, regression equation from it all right um, yeah confidence intervals go through all of this all right they give you um, the various things let's see hi back here these are for the confidence intervals go pretty quickly um, you can pick out like here's the low end and the high end for data desk and so on I don't want to give it all away I think you can probably figure it out uh, one sample t-test all right again anything with analysis of variance just ignore it glad that I'm getting all of my <laughs> my news uh, by mail updates all right two sample t-tests if you can figure that out and um, and then chi-square test of independence see if you can remember this going back to what we did before when we finished up with chi-square should be pretty fresh in your head so um, I reprinted all this I'm sorry for the quality of this this is uh, been through the ringer as you can see it's an old old image but I redid this so for homework all I need for you to do is you know for page 254 and these things should be uh, the numbers the pages should be numbered just put a check if these particular things are available from the output for each of these things right and it's available for these four things so that's all you have to do you can print this out put checks in there upload it you can go to doc hub and this is a PDF and you can put the checks in there you know back download it and then upload it to canvas um, you could even probably do this on your own paper although it'd be a little easier if you can print this out or use doc hub so that's everything I am going to bid you a fond farewell